So hello and welcome to video number three of conservation paleobiology. In this video, we're going to look at the most important direct drivers of current biodiversity loss and changes in ecosystem services. That's kind of what ecosystems can provide to us as humans that are valuable to us. Um, and we will also see how conservation paleobiology can help us understand the impact of these um, changes. So without further ado, let's look at these one by one. And we're going to start by looking at the impact that habitat change can have on the animal communities in an area. So as I said in the first video, humans have modified more than 50% of the ice-free land surface on the Earth. Major changes that we are facing include deforestation for agriculture and urban development, the draining of wetlands for human uses, and the damming and channelization of rivers. So all of these are things that will impact on the animal communities that live in the area. In case you were wondering, things are no better in the oceans. Um, for example, the effects of fishing and bycatch have impacted every square kilometer of ocean um, and driven ecological change throughout all oceans that we have on Earth. So predicting biotic responses to these kind of um, habitat changes uh, through direct observation is very, very difficult. Estimates of the timing and the extent of biodiversity change have large uncertainties when we're just looking out at the impact that we're having for some of the reasons that I highlighted in the last video as well. Conservation paleobiology, however, can help. So paleoecological studies will reveal responses that could not have been predicted solely from looking at modern ecological data and the associated theories we've built up around that. A fine example of this is this paper by um, Wilcox in 1978, who used the um, relatively recent fossil record of lizards from the islands in the Gulf of California, uh, two of these species are actually shown on this slide here, to study lizard species richness in deep time. And what this study showed is that when sea levels rose and the islands became isolated and their habitable, habitable, uh, their habitable areas became smaller, lizard species richness does not seem to decline as expected for at least 10,000 years. This overturns the expectation that we have based on the decreased area of those islands coupled with a thing called the species area effect, an ecological principle based on observing modern ecosystems that say that larger areas tend to contain larger numbers of species. Now, that's really interesting. And this lagged response to habitat change, in this case, size reduction, um, but has now been documented or inferred for other groups of animals and for other changes in habitats, including alpine mammals, in birds, and millennial scale lags in conifer forests. So when it comes to habitat change, we're getting um, some surprises from studying the fossil records within this light. Anthropogenic climate change is a, a constant, as I'm sure you're aware, it's a thing that's happening, and biotic responses to recent climate changes have been studied largely using observational data on living plants and animals. But if we want to understand what the, the true impact is of climate change, we have to think about things at a kind of uh, potentially a bigger scale and deeper um, into the, the history of life. In particular, this is true because future predictions of the responses of living organisms to climate change are based on modeling. And models are quite difficult to validate using the relatively limited range of recent climate variability. In contrast to that, the fossil record provides us with unique information on the biological consequences of climate change, which we can then use to validate these models. It provides countless natural experiments um, where we can look at the ecological and the evolutionary responses to a wide range of different forms of climate change and different extents of climate change. That constrains our predictions and can yield general insights that can help us understand biotic responses to climate changes. So my example here um, actually looks at ma the mammal response, or the response of the mammal community, I guess I should say, to a thing called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal max Maximum, or the PETM. Now this is an event that happened 56 million years ago. It was a period of rapid global warming, and I'll go into it a tiny bit further into, in one of my other examples. 
But the important thing to note here is that um, this graph here shows a thing called delta 18O, and this is a proxy for temperature change um, in terms of the mean annual temperature um, across this time period. And you can see that there was a, a, a big spike in temperature during this thing called the, the PETM. The graph on the right here shows the response in the body size of the early horse. Um, I don't actually know how to pronounce this. Cifrohippus sandre, I believe. Uh, reconstruction of this cool creature is shown on the right here. And what this diagram shows is that there was a 30% decrease in the body size of this species over a time interval of 130,000 years. And this was largely an adaptive response to the increasing temperature that was um, occurring in Western North America at this time. Now that's a really useful insight. Increasing temperatures has led in that species to a decrease in body size. And that's interesting because it's a trend that is consistent with evidence from the modern fauna, where we're seeing reduced body size for many species. And people have started linking that to a warming climate over the last century. This fossil data supports the idea that it may be climate change that is driving that change in modern ecosystems and in modern animal communities. And that's a really important observation. So next we can move on to think about what the impact is of the exploitation by humans and the subsequent extinction that tends to happen when we exploit a resource of wild species. So we actually suffer from a lack of well-documented time series in this general area, especially for periods prior to the 1970s when conservation became something that was more widely considered. Before that point, we didn't really consider it something that was important. This creates a significant barrier to assessing the impact of human exploitations on species and ecosystems um, and understanding what we're doing to our ecosystems today. But, fear not, the rec rock record provides an overview of the effects of resource depression by humans on both organismal behavior and body size, for example, but also um, it provides insights into the responses not of not just the individual organisms, but the communities of which these organisms are a part of. So, so for example, it provides insights into the abundance and to the species composition of animal communities. It must be said that um, studies that actually do this are relatively rare at the moment, but I did manage to find a really cool example for you. And this is based on the work of Edgar and Sansom. It was published in 2004. The paper is cited here as in conservation biology. And these authors used um, down core changes in shell assemblages. So um, as you go down um, a, a drill core, you're looking at changes in time. And these authors assess the changes in the shells that they found in those cores to then understand how the scallop dredging industry affected molluscan populations in estuaries in Tasmania. Um, as a result of this study, they found strong, otherwise undocumented declines in species diversity and in the abundance of members of species. So we're losing species and those species that remain, there were fewer individuals. And all of that, they showed, coincided with the commercial harvest of just two scallop species. They managed to reveal through this work that dredging was a primary driver in the collapse of the scallop fishery in this area. Area. <laughs> area is the word I was looking for there. So that's my scallop example. But I put one more in, and this is the um, uh, work of um, Baumgartner that was published in 1992, because I thought this was a really good um, comparison. So this study used fish scales from cores to show cycles in the abundance of two key commercial fish species of the Californian coast, most specifically sardines and anchovies. Uh, these are anchovies that are shown on the right hand side here. And what Baumgartner showed is that these cycles occurred over decades and they were out of phase with one another. So in this light, fishery data that started showing a sharp decline in the 20th century in one species accompanied by a rise in the other could well be 
just a natural um, a natural process resulting from a climate oscillation or a regime change in the Pacific rather than the result of human impact. So we've got two nice competing examples here. One where looking at um, long-term data through the fossil record or through cause in this case showed that human impact is um, strong in one particular area and another showing that what we may think could be human impact could actually be something else. So that's uh, the impact um, of exploitation or lack thereof that can be revealed by the fossil record. The fossil record can also help us understand the impact of biological invasions. Documentation of human caused species invasions by necessity focus on the short term biological consequences. We, um, we observe them as they're happening. And we've generally only done that over the past century. Before that point, we didn't really care quite so much. So on this time scale, the process of invasion has probably not completed, especially if we think about the evolutionary response and the evolutionary adaptations that will occur as a result of inv an invasion, we wouldn't be expected to be able to observe those over just a century. But fear not. In this case, the fossil record can again help us understand past invasions. It can provide opportunities to explore their long-term consequences, even if they're not invasions that were caused by humans. Um, we have lots of examples of invasions that may uh, be the result of changes in paleogeography, for example. Studies of um, invasions in the fossil record suggest that generally successful invasions are asymmetrical. We can observe in the fossil record that there is a predominant direction of an invasion from a larger, biologically more diverse area. Um, organisms are moving into smaller, less diverse areas. In one of these events, the fossil record also suggests to us that prior or ongoing disturbances in a region can be important in regulating the um, intensity and the impact of a given invasion. It's vital context to understand. All of this can help us identify the likely direction of future large-scale biotic interchanges, such as that we're expecting as the Earth's climate warms over the next century. So this can, to an extent, help us predict what is going to happen. My example here is based on the uh, work of Levin et al. 2002. I apologize, that's not shown on this slide, so let me just, there we go. I just, I modified the underlying slide, so, um. <laughs> I've just added it here. Uh, this is based on the uh, grazing of salt marshes on the eastern coast of the United States, which um, occurs uh, in terms of feral horses that are descended from Spanish herds. And these horses appear to promote higher bird diversity, crab density, and they are associated with other positive outcomes. The fossil record shows that native North American horses were actually members of the regional community in this area from the PETM until the late Pleistocene, just 11,000 years ago, when these niches are emptied. So in this example, the fossil record is providing us with some vital context here, actually. These feral horses may have been introduced by humans, but they're actually um, filling some niches that were only very recently vacated, hence the positive outcomes they're having. And this will then feed into the discussion of, are these feral horses necessarily bad? And should we be rewilding this area? And if so, should those be included in, in that rewilding effort? So I think that's really... Um, a really, really cool example. So I wanted to finish this quick look-see at um, environmental stresses and the impact that they have on life and what the fossil record can tell us about that by looking at things called biogeochemical disturbances, basically just big shifts in the um, chemistry of a uh, ecosystem or a region um, and the impact that that has on life. And we can't just rely on direct observation over short timescales to understand these biotic responses to changes such as this. This is because we have trouble scaling um, up those small observations to big spatial or um, temporal scales, and as a result of errors surrounding um, our understanding of the timing and the magnitudes of disturbance, it's quite hard to get that kind of like overall picture of one of these events. And that's true in both land-based and marine ecosystems. But geological records can do a far better job 
arguably, of showing the timing and the pervasiveness of perturbations when these occur. And I wanted to provide a specific example of this. Now, we know that um, deep time records can provide us with an unparalleled view of the um, chemical consequences of rapid carbon addition. Um, and worlds which have high levels of CO2 in, these are obviously very, very important for understanding the impact that anthropogenic changes will have on the globe in the future. One such um, time period was this thing called the Paleothene Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM, that I've already mentioned. This was marked by a rapid injection of large amounts of new carbon, carbon dioxide and methane, into the atmosphere, ocean, um, biosphere system. Um, these, ha these injections happened in less than 10,000 years, so very, very quick on the geological timescale. The source and the exact quantities of these greenhouse gases is fairly poorly constrained and it's highly debated. It's not something that I'm going to be going into in any depth here. But what we do know is that this injection caused a rapid shift in the climate. So we can use pollen evidence, and some, there are some examples recovered from an Arctic core on the left here, to show that during this time period, the Arctic climate was far warmer than it is today. Here is a, um, a reconstruction showing um, the Paleocene Arctic. Um, and it was, for example, dominated by mixed conifer hardwood forests. We know also that the PETM led to the acidification of oceans. That resulted in the dissolution of seafloor carbonates and then a decrease in carbonate production in the oceans. We then further know from these records that that was followed by a pulse of biogenic carbonate accumulation, so carbonate accumulation driven by, by, by biology, by organisms during the recovery. And we know that that recovery took tens of millennia if we put that all together, we can say that this is deeply problematic, given that many of our future scenarios for fossil fuel combustion um, ha are associated with the CO2 spike that is in, in similar or larger scales to the one that occurred during the PETM. And this PETM record thus supports predictions um, that we have today from carbon cycle models, which say that if we continue to emit large amounts of new carbon, it will remain at the Earth's surface for a period far longer than the entire past human history of civilization. Um, and this record supports that idea. I'll put a link to um, a podcast on the PETM in the bonus um, materials for this website if you want to learn some more. But that's another example that's really pertinent to what's going on today in the world. And with that, I will leave you for video three and I'll see you shortly in video number four. See you soon.